Welcome to Civil Discourses. I am your host, Megan Warren, and we are here today discussing with Dr. John Maurer. Um, professor Maurer is the Alfred Thayer Mahan Distinguished Professor of Sea Power and Grand Strategy at the U.S. Naval War College. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you um, for having me. Can you start by telling us just a little bit about yourself and your work with the War College? I came to the War College over 30 years ago in 1988 as a 30-something uh, professor. My background was in history and uh, also international relations. I have a PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And I had worked as a research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia before coming to the Naval War College in 1988. And when I came to the Naval War College in 1988, I had no idea that I was going to stay there for over 30 years. But it's been a rewarding experience for me to be at the college. I enjoy very much working with the students. The students at the college are from the armed services of the United States, in residence over 500 uh, officers, they come from all the services, the Navy, as you would expect from a Naval War College, and Marines, but also Army, Air Force, Coast Guard. We also have national security professionals, civilians, State Department, uh, who study there as well. In addition to the American students who are there at the college, there are also over 100 officers from partner countries around the world that study there as well and they are fully integrated into our core teaching program. So each seminar at the college will have 10 or so American officers and two or three officers, international officers, from other countries. This past spring in my seminar, uh, in addition to having American officers, I had uh, uh, an officer from Chile, an officer from New Zealand, and an officer from Australia. So we have a nice mix of both American students and students from other countries. And that very much enlivens seminar too because the students from the other countries are not bashful mm -hmm. about sharing their opinions about the United States. <laughs> and so it, it, it really does broaden our officers, the interaction, American officers and working in the classroom with uh, other officers who are students as well at the college. The college, the Naval War College, offers a master's degree in national security affairs. It's a 10-month program uh, that the students study in Newport. The uh, college goes back to 1884, and we pride ourselves as being the oldest war college in existence, continuous existence since 1884. The uh, founding president of the Naval War College was uh, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Bleeker Luce. He was a naval officer who was a naval hero of the American Civil War. And during the Civil War, he uh, was impressed very much by how Army officers seemed to be so much better educated than Navy officers when it came to operations and strategy. And so one of the things he wanted to do was to create a postgraduate school for Navy officers so that they could learn more about higher levels of command. And so the Naval War College was born in 1884 and uh, it's been in existence ever since, educating officers from the Navy, the Marines and other services, and international officers since the 1890s. So it has a, a long tradition and it's a wonderful school and place to, to work. So I've enjoyed my 30 years there yeah. with the officers. That sounds terrific. It sounds like a very good, diverse place to be, too, with the international students and the U.S. students. Yes. Um, so you gave a lecture last night regarding President Woodrow Wilson and the Treaty of Versailles. Um, for many Americans, it seems that World War I is overshadowed by the events of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So sitting here 100 years after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, 
Can you tell us the greatest takeaway from World War I and what you think that every American should know about the Great War and the Treaty of Versailles? The First World War is a turning point in American history. And as you just mentioned, it gets overshadowed by other wars that the United States has fought, a revolutionary struggle that gained us our independence, the American Civil War, Second World War, Vietnam, and today, of course, the War on Terror. The First World War, though, shouldn't be overshadowed because it's a major turning point in American history. For the first time, large numbers of American soldiers are being deployed far away from the Western Hemisphere. Up to this point in American history, the United States, our leaders, when they looked at the country's security position, thought of themselves as a hemispheric power to defend the Western Hemisphere against aggression from outside the Western Hemisphere, that the old world in some way threatened the new world. And so American leaders from the time of the founding of the Republic, with the Monroe Doctrine, generation later, thought about how do you protect the United States and the Western Hemisphere from predatory behavior of the great powers that were in Eurasia, in Europe and Asia. Well, with the First World War, the United States became involved uh, in sending forces, troops, outside of the Western Hemisphere. We realized that to be secure in the Western Hemisphere, that we had to make sure that the old world, that there was no one dominant power there that would become so strong that it would threaten us in the Western Hemisphere. So rather than having a defensive orientation, it was recognized that the United States has to work with partners, bring the new world's power to bear to the old world, to support partners who were defending themselves against aggression. And so in the First World War, the United States deployed by the end of the war in 1918, November 1918, had deployed over two million American soldiers to France. This was something that was would have been considered impossible just a few years before. To give an example, in 1913, the United States came up with a war plan called War Plan Black, which was for war against Imperial Germany. And in that war plan, American naval planners and army planners thought that the next war, if it were fought with Germany, would come about because Germany attacked across the Atlantic with its fleet and would seize forward bases like Nantucket Island or Block Island and would bombard American coastal cities like Boston and New York. Very much a defensive orientation. So if you had said to American planners, Navy and Army planners in 1913, that within five years the United States would deploy over two million soldiers to France and then bring them home again, they would have said, oh, that's impossible. Couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. But the impossible did happen. And so this is a major turning point. And Woodrow Wilson plays a major role in this because he was reluctant to take the United States into the war. He wanted to maintain the neutrality of the United States. But Germany's actions on the high seas, its use of submarines and sinking large numbers of ships, resulted in the US entering the war. And the US entering the war then led to this great deployment of American forces to the old world. And the American contribution was important in tipping the balance against Imperial Germany and defeating Imperial Germany in the war. So this is the first time that the U.S. has committed itself to the security of other countries, protecting them against aggression in the old world. So it's a major turning point, and it's not recognized. We think of the role that the U.S. played in the Second World War and after in the Cold War of maintaining security partnerships with other countries. But uh, it's already starting here, 100 years ago, in 1918-1919. Absolutely. So, talking a little bit more about President Wilson, um, he spearheaded the League of Nations. Mm -hmm. So, although he couldn't get U.S. Congress to join the organization, um, do you believe that the lack of a U.S. presence in the League of Nations was a contributing factor to its decline? Um, or do you believe that there were inherent, deeper, structural problems within the League? That the United States didn't join the League of Nations certainly undermined 
the influence and the power of the League. The United States under Woodrow Wilson had been one of the big proponents of the League. He was not alone though. Republicans as well as Democrats wanted to see a League. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize before the First World War, had talked about a League to enforce the peace, that the great powers should get together to uh, police the world, uh, to prevent aggression. And so this idea of a League to enforce the peace existed even before the First World War, that disputes would be settled through arbitration, that if anyone broke uh, arbitration and committed aggressive acts, the other powers would almost automatically then gang up on them. And this would deter aggression. So there had already been a great deal of thought that had gone into the idea of a league. Woodrow Wilson spearheaded it though. He thought it was important that the United States stay internationally engaged in providing for the security of other countries. The United States was already involved economically with the rest of the world. We were not isolated economically or diplomatically. Where the United States was isolated before was that we pretty much clung to the Western Hemisphere. We weren't offering security guarantees against aggression to other countries far away around the globe. What Wilson wanted to do was to link the United States up with other countries and that the United States would be part of a security pact with other countries. In many ways, the League of Nations conception resembles that of the Atlantic Alliance. Article 5 of the Atlantic Alliance that came about in 1949 after the Second World War is that an attack against any one country that's part of the alliance is considered an attack against them all, and all would respond accordingly. So the League was something akin to that. It was a way to deter aggression by having member states line up together against aggression. So the United States not joining it certainly undercut the power, because the United States was the strongest economic power in the world at this point, 100 years ago. And so that the world's largest economy wasn't connected in providing security to other countries certainly undermined the strength and the credibility of, of the League. Absolutely, I agree. So let's relate the discussion of the League of Nations to the contemporary form, the United Nations, um, so recent reports have been released that cite about a third of the countries of the UN are not making their full contributions, including the US, uh, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Do you believe that these failure to payments um, are detrimental and do you find it concerning? Um, and what do you think about the overall structure of the United Nations? The United Nations is different in many ways from the conception that Wilson had for the League of Nations. And today, the United Nations is effective in many, many ways. It's important in providing for disaster relief, uh, emergency relief services, providing for collective action. Uh, it has also have played an important role in peacekeeping activities, again, in the, uh, bringing together the international community to police uh, troubled areas where there might be disputes to uh, form up blue helmets to get between warring parties. So the United Nations has played a, a, an important role uh, in uh, uh, its history since 1945. Where it has fallen down, however, is that the members of the League, uh, of this new League, the United Nations, um, there's a great deal of politics involved in everything that they do. And so disagreements about policies then lead to member states saying, well, I'm not going to support this or that initiative. And hence, uh, the politics within the United Nations undermines its credibility in, in many, many ways. As you would expect in a, a body that represents so many diverse points of view, mm -hmm. you're not going to get agreement uh, on this. And so states are not willing to fund things that they don't approve of. And uh, that's a, a reality, a reality of uh, the United Nations today. Its effectiveness in deterring aggression uh, is something that I'm sure President Wilson would say uh, is, is a failure. You don't, have, you don't have the member states having the same sort of agreement that Wilson would have about what aggression means. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been instances where the international community 
has come together at the United Nations. The Korean War was one example. The Gulf War of 1991, where the international community could coalesce, more or less, uh, most of the member states coalesce together for collective action to deter, to roll back aggression. But those episodes are, are, um, uh, are more the anomaly. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, politics plays such an important role and divergent political and international ambitions make it so that the United Nations is uh, not going to be as effective as a tool uh, of promoting the peace as what Woodrow Wilson wanted to have. Absolutely. So switching topics just a little bit, what do you think about President Trump's recent decision to withdraw US, Trump, US troops from Syria? Um, do you believe that this will lead to undesirable outcomes such as the ethnic cleansing of Kurds or the resurgence of ISIS? Uh, um, since this question deals with some policy matters, I have to issue a disclaimer, um, which I maybe should have done right up front, <laughs> which is uh, anything I say uh, represents my own opinion, my own point of view, and does not represent the point of view of the Naval War College, the Department of the Navy, the Department of Defense, or any uh, uh, element of the U.S. government. I think that's obvious, and anyone <laughs> should know that. But nonetheless, uh, it's important that I issue that disclaimer. Uh, with regard to um, um, uh, Syria today, the Kurds, Turkey, um, it, I want to take a step back again a hundred years ago to the end of the First World War. Because the First World War was fought not only in Europe and at sea, but also in the Middle East. The First World War was a huge war in the Middle East. The Ottoman Empire at that time controlled the Middle East. Uh, it was um, part of the Central Power Alliance with Austria, Hungary, and Germany. And so the British and the French uh, took active military operations in the Middle East. And at the end of the war, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Uh, and the result was that the victorious powers then decided to start drawing new boundaries for the Middle East. And so many of the boundaries that we see today for Syria, Iraq, uh, uh, Israel, then Palestine, are all being drawn at the end of the First World War. At the time, the experts uh, on the Middle East, in France and in Britain, drew what they thought were the best lines of demarcation. Uh, at the time, it was thought that a Kurdish state should be created. The Kurds are a distinct nationality, ethnic group in the Middle East. And Woodrow Wilson uh, and most liberals in Britain thought that uh, one of the most just ways of forming boundaries was to have uh, national self-determination, that boundary lines should be drawn that link together peoples who have a common culture, language, history, heritage. And so the Kurds, uh, uh, as a result of the First World War, though, didn't get their own national homeland. And they're divided between three countries, Iraq, uh, Turkey, and also Iran. So to have a Kurdish state, which is the aspirations of all Kurdish peoples, uh, would mean taking territory from Iraq, mm -hmm. from Turkey, and from Iran. So the borders of the current day Middle East don't reflect that, that again go back to the end of the First World War, the early 1920s, don't reflect in some way the national aspirations of a large group of people, the Kurds. Mm -hmm. And so that's the source of the current day problem. Um, the Turkish government looks at uh, Turkish, uh, uh, Kurdish nationalists who want to create a state, who wage a terror campaign against the Turkish state to try to gain independence for the Kurdish peoples uh, uh, within Turkey. They're looked as a terrorist group by Turkey and also by the United States. And Turkey is a member of the Atlantic Alliance mm -hmm. in this. So this is a very complicated, difficult problem. Do you alienate a, a NATO ally uh, in Turkey? Uh, can you draw borders that somehow reflect the aspirations of the Kurdish people, which are many people support? Um, uh, but at the same time, then, can you do it without a major war? Mm -hmm. Because it means partitioning in some way Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. Mm -hmm. So to do that, uh, you could create a war that would create even more violence than what we see today. With regard to Syria, Syria is part of a larger problem that was stretching across the Middle East, which we saw in the Arab Spring, 
which is that the ruling dynasties in uh, several of the countries, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt, uh, Iraq for that matter, uh, and Syria, uh, the strong men in all of those countries were hoping to pass on to their sons leadership, and the peoples of the region rebelled against that. And so the Middle East has been in turmoil because of this change of generation of leadership. The Syrian war, the war in Libya, uh, again reflect the uh, uh, political incoherence, the inability to make a transition to uh, uh, a new age. Mm -hmm. And so the Syrian war has been an international catastrophe, of course, mm -hmm. with the loss of life and also the outflows of people from uh, the, the, the region. It's very hard to come up with a solution, quote unquote, to Syria and the Kurdish problem without seeing more violence coming along. Yeah. Um, it could well be that the Middle East at some point, the violence will burn itself out. And then of course you also have warring parties in this that Iran, uh, Tehran has its own ambitions in the region, yeah. which uh, the Saudi regime and in Israel feel very much threatened by. And so there's many different layers of, of anxiety, of security, of questions of legitimacy, of religious and ethnic identity that are at stake here. And um, as the leaders found out a hundred years ago, trying to draw boundary lines and creating a just peace there uh, is next to an impossible problem. There are some problems that can't be solved. They have to be managed as best you can, and you hope you manage them with the minimum of violence. Yeah. But we're not seeing that today in the Middle East. Absolutely. So we've touched on this a little bit. Um, you mentioned Turkey previously, but do you believe that we should be wary of Turkey, even though they are a NATO ally? Um, and do you believe that they're a dependable partner? Uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, Turkey has been a dependable partner throughout the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Atlantic Alliance was formed as a response to the Soviet Union's threat to the Middle East as well as to uh, Europe. Uh, Turkey played a major role in the Second World War, and it's often forgotten that its neutrality in the Second World War prevented Nazi Germany from having an overland roadway into the Middle East. Mm -hmm. If Turkey had sided with Nazi Germany in the Second World War, that war could have taken a much different turn for the worse. So uh, Turkey in many ways has shown itself to be uh, an important partner uh, of the West, uh, both in the Second World War and in during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And those are important obligations to, to remember. Uh, Turkey lives in a rough neighborhood, is what it comes down to. Uh, and there's a great deal of violence uh, on its borders. It is faced by the internal problem of Kurds who want, we talked about, mm -hmm. who want independence, mm -hmm. that threaten to destabilize the state. Um, Turkey, we have to put ourselves in, in the shoes of the Turkish leadership and understand what their problems are. Mm -hmm. And those problems will continue regardless of who is in charge at Ankara. Um, so we, we have, to, have to remember the, those obligations to Turkey and also the constructive role that Turkey can play in the future as well. Um, right now, in looking at uh, the Turkish government, um, you, there are problems that we have with them, for sure, uh, as all partnerships do. And there has been, in recent years, a downturn in, in that partnership. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, we have to think not only in the present, but also in the long run, and think about where are the common interests of the United States and Turkey in promoting uh, a more uh, peaceful environment in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And there, Turkey can play a major role. In the past, it has played a major role of being uh, an important prop for uh, international stability in the Middle East. Absolutely. Um, so all of that considered, what is an overall grade that you would give Trump on foreign policy? I, I'm, I'm, I'm a lenient grader. <laughs> I am a Santa Claus when it comes to grading. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure I, I want to give a numerical or letter grade out, but I, I'd, I'd like to just, uh, I think, um, if you will, highlight some of the, the things that I think that uh, the Trump administration has done, mm -hmm. for which it deserves some credit, but then also some things that I think where there's some weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, on the positive side, there are some real continuities that I don't think most people recognize between the Obama administration and the Trump administration foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Both President Obama and President Trump 
have said publicly, repeatedly, that they disagreed with the foreign policy of George W. Bush, that uh, the preceding administration of President Bush uh, was one that they uh, thought um, overextended American power in the Middle East. Both President Obama and President Trump have said that the Iraq War of 2003, overthrowing Saddam Hussein's regime, was a mistake. Mm -hmm. So there's an important continuity there between President Obama and President Trump that I, I think people tend to downplay or ignore. President Trump uh, has said that he wants to reduce the American presence in the Middle East, the fighting in the Middle East. And that's part of what his uh, decisions are with regard to Syria uh, uh, today. Um, President Obama had the same view, which is how do you reduce the American footprint in the Middle East? Um, both uh, President Obama and President Trump have wanted to withdraw troops from the region. Uh, President Obama taking troops out of Iraq. Uh, President Trump wanting to withdraw the footprint from Afghanistan. Both presidents did go ahead with surges uh, in Afghanistan, but reluctantly uh, uh, and did it because they thought there was the best military advice given to them. But both uh, believed that, um, that any gains that would be made would be temporary. So both presidents have tried to follow a uh, overall policy strategy of reducing the American presence in the Middle East, while at the same time standing by important allies in the region, mm -hmm. and, uh, but also keeping open the prospect of negotiating with the other side. Um, uh, with regard to Tehran, President Obama had negotiations with Iran. Uh, President Trump has shown a willingness to negotiate too. He's taken a somewhat harder line, uh, but nonetheless would like to have uh, uh, negotiations with Iran. So there's important continuities between Obama and Trump about reducing the American presence, military presence, ground presence in the Middle East. Both presidents, too, identified China as a rising threat. Again, I think it's um, somewhat forgotten today that Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, was one of the authors of the so-called pivot to Asia, mm -hmm. that the United States had to de-emphasize the Middle East and give more attention to East Asia because of the rise of China's power. Mm -hmm. uh, President Trump uh, certainly echoes that point of view. So again, there's a continuity between Hillary Clinton, President Obama, and President Trump. Mm -hmm. Uh, they all see the rise of China as being perhaps the most dangerous, the most serious long-term security threat to the United States that has to be addressed in some way mm -hmm. by counter, some countervailing American power to that of China. Um, so there's important continuities between the two administrations that I think are often overlooked or, or not given enough attention. President Trump has taken up the China challenge uh, in, a, in a way that I think has surprised many people. Uh, he has attempted to disentangle the two economies because he believes that China has gained important strategic advantages over the United States by what he sees are unfair trading practices. Now he's heavily criticized for what is seen as being using a crude tool of tariffs to somehow disentangle these two economies. But nonetheless, I think he has forged a consensus that will survive him, which is that our trade, our economic connections, our technological flows uh, with China have to be more heavily regulated and controlled, whether it's by tra tariff or regulation. But uh, you see both Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. agreeing with the overall goal, even if they don't like the specific uh, tools mm -hmm. that Trump uh, uh, happens to be using. So one thing that will survive Trump uh, is that uh, the United States is going to take a harder line toward China. Uh, the recent crackdown on, uh, in Hong Kong has highlighted again that there's an ideological split there between authoritarian one-party rule within China and our um, own aspirations, the United States, to promote freedom and liberal democracies. Mm -hmm. And so our hearts certainly go out to the people of Hong Kong. Um, so uh, in, in this, um, I think you'll see that, uh, that Trump is in some way um, 
uh, forged a consensus, a bipartisan view, mm -hmm. that uh, the next president uh, will probably want to follow, even if they use different uh, tools. So th that, those are some of the plus sides that I think you see with uh, President Trump. On the negative side, um, he seems so out of control with his tweets and the rest, and as a consequence, it's not seen as good diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Now, he might think it's a way of getting leverage, the art of the deal, that uh, somehow this is how you improve your bargaining position by taking a tough line. And in many instances, I think it, it, it's appropriate. But I think with allies, uh, uh, long-term partners with which we have deep connections, deep common interests, there it can sometimes be counterproductive, and it plays to a view of an ugly American. And I, I think we could use less of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that the United States always recognize that we have our own league outside of the United Nations, a long-standing league, mm -hmm. which is a league of democracies uh, represented by our major alliance partners, Japan, South Korea, of course, Western Europe, uh, and in the Western Hemisphere. And the United States has to stand by those democracies. We all have to stand together. The great tragedy of the interwar period was that the liberal democracies of the Atlantic world, Britain, France, and the United States, didn't band together into an Atlantic alliance to try to deter or defeat Nazi aggression early on. Uh, we learned that lesson. We created these alliances because we believe that the United States is stronger and more secure by being linked to our allies. Now, I think President Trump deserves credit for highlighting that some of our allies can do more. We certainly see in Japan that the Japanese are doing more because of their fear of China in defense efforts. I think that our European allies can certainly do more uh, to bolster the common defense, especially against Putin's Russia, even as we look to the long term beyond Putin to see how we can uh, build a solid relationship with Russia. Uh, in the long term. Um, so I, I think that Trump deserves some good marks, but at the same time, in any way that he might erode these bonds that link together the democracies of the world, that somehow create the ugly American image among our best partners, closest partners, that, that is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. The American president has to come across as a leader of free peoples, and that should always be, first and foremost, in any of our rhetoric, rather than negative rhetoric. So I, I would give him low marks when it comes to talking about partners, uh, and, uh, and instead uh, take the higher road when it comes to dealing with our partners. Perfectly stated. Um, so the 2018 National Defense Strategy lays out several security challenges facing the U.S. Um, among these are the rise of revisionist powers, which we've mentioned, China and Russia, um, cyber warfare and nuclear proliferation. So, in your view, what is the greatest threat to U.S. national security in the next decade, and what will the 2020s look like from a geopolitical perspective? That, that um, when we look at the world today, I think the uh, both the national security strategy and the national defense strategy that the Trump administration promulgated both are well thought out documents, and they deserve to be read, both of them. Uh, again, it shows that a great deal of serious thought went into them, and I think that they represent uh, a consensus view among the uh, uh, people who are involved in national security affairs, that the big challenges out there are the ones that you identified. Uh, China, first and foremost, because of the rise of the Chinese economy, the technology that China has, that they uh, are able to build up a powerful military. Uh, uh, quite a competitive military with the U.S. that threatens our allies in East Asia, Japan, Australia. And so as a consequence, uh, that is a major challenge, perhaps the most important challenge that faces the United States, where we are facing a peer competitor, a country with a very strong economy and technological base that can develop um, a very strong military power mm -hmm. against us, in particular uh, ballistic missiles that are highly accurate and also a, a Navy uh, capabilities to be able to strike out into the Western Pacific. Uh, a major security threat is also that China and Russia are collaborating with each other. 
that is a collaboration that we should do our utmost to try to break apart. One of the key elements of strategy is to uh, make sure you're a good coalition leader. But the flip side of that is, if your enemy has a coalition, your adversary, you try to break it apart mm -hmm. as much as you can. And so during the Cold War, when communist China and communist Russia were together, we worked to try to split them apart. And you had the famous Nixon-Kissinger opening to China. Uh, already China was an enemy of the Soviet Union, but that we recognized that and tried to exploit that, worked to our advantage in the closing stages of the Cold War. What we need to do in the long run is look to see how we can split the weaker Russia off from China. I don't think that's possible under the current Russian regime of Putin. But playing the long game, we should also be looking to a transition that in the post-Putin world, that we try to build bridges with uh, Russia mm -hmm. and try to uh, wean them away from China and have China start to look at Russia as a threat to them. Uh, if we were to do that, that would be uh, uh, something that would uh, decrease China's power in the world because China has a long land frontier with Russia, and if they feel threatened there, they will be less able to project their power out into the Pacific. So in the long run, we should be looking to split apart that partnership that now exists between Russia and China. With regard to nuclear proliferation, this is dangerous because in the Middle East, you could have Tehran, the Iranian regime, getting nuclear weapons. With nuclear weapons, they might become more aggressive in supporting terrorism in the region, disrupting energy supplies and flows in the region. So anything that can be done in the way of collective united action to try to make sure that uh, Iran doesn't develop capable nuclear forces is in the interest of the international community. Mm -hmm. And on this, uh, the United States has to get uh, our European allies, our Asian allies on board. Uh, we have to try as best we can to get China and Russia to recognize that it's really in their interest as well, even though they don't see it that way now. But the more international pressure we can bring to Iran uh, to get a better deal with regard to nuclear proliferation uh, benefits us. North Korea is um, another dangerous area where Trump has tried his diplomacy, both personal outreach, uh, to try to uh, end the uh, North Korea's nuclear uh, capability. Uh, that's unlikely to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot bring enough pressure to bear on North Korea. We have to, I fear, I fear, live with that state possessing nuclear weapons. And so we have to put a great deal of effort into making sure that we and our allies have ballistic missile defenses as much as possible to counter that threat with military means. We also have to make sure that in the future we try to counter as best we can, make it more difficult for them to improve their nuclear capabilities. And of course one of the most important things we have to do is make sure that nuclear weapons never get into the hands of non-state terrorist groups. Uh, we never want to see uh, a group like Al-Qaeda that pulled off the September 11th attacks being able to get their hands on nuclear weapons. One region of the world where we have to pay attention, even though we are not immediately concerned with, with allies, is India and Pakistan. Here you have two nuclear armed states that have uh, major disagreements with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, Kashmir has flared up as a bone of contention between these two states. We have to play an important active role there in making sure that any fighting, any contest that goes on between India and Pakistan doesn't turn into a nuclear war. Yeah. That's a very dangerous frontier that we have to pay attention to. So those are all critical areas. With regard to cyber, cyber domain is an area in which today uh, we have tried to deter actions from uh, uh, non-state actors as well as state actors who use cyber to pirate uh, things to get information. Um, we also have to start thinking about how best we might use uh, more offensive capabilities in cyber to enhance deterrence, to strike back at those that are striking us all the time. We are under constant cyber threat. Mm -hmm. And so we have to um, rethink what our rules of engagement will be in the cyber domain. And so cyber is an important 
instrument of military power. Uh, it's also important for our diplomacy in being effective. Uh, it's a tool that we have to think about how we want to use it. Right now, there is a great deal of control over it and how it is used. And so uh, we, we have to, we have to, uh, we have a lot of work to do there uh, and, and thinking through where we want to use cyber in a more aggressive way to go after those that are injuring us mm -hmm. and not just be thinking about defensives or defensive action to defend ourselves against cyber attack but 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 and, and also protecting our ourselves infrastructure as well as information from cyber uh, theft but also be thinking about how we can use cyber to uh, uh, undermine adversaries who are, are turning this domain against us. Absolutely. So, I know we've focused the bulk of this discussion on international issues, um, but this show is primarily interested in addressing political divisiveness that exists in our domestic politics. So what do you think um, could be done to increase more bipartisan discourse in our country and to mend the contentious political climate that we currently see today? On this, I think that some perspective is useful. Uh, the United States as a democracy, throughout our history, we have had many rancorous debates uh, about uh, important matters that people have strong views on. And so our domestic politics reflects underlying divisions of the American people. And so our representatives, those who are elected, uh, and those who are commentators, are reflecting the views of the American people. So I don't, I don't think you can stifle that debate. I think that uh, right now the American people are divided on a number of important topics that uh, are hard to bridge. It would be great, though, I think, to see our political leaders uh, be willing to shake hands a bit more uh, to, to try to cross those divides. But when you look at American history, you see that uh, there are a number of times when, uh, from the founding of the Republic on, where uh, important leaders just couldn't get along. Uh, in fact, our, our founding fathers looked at it and they were afraid of faction as being so divisive. So I don't mean to minimize your, your concern and your question. It's a clearly an important, uh, we can be, have so much faction that it can lead to a breakdown as happened during the American Civil War in which almost 700,000 Americans were killed because uh, our domestic political scene couldn't come up with compromise mm -hmm. on a fundamental issue, that of slavery. So uh, these divisions can run deep. Uh, Part of, of uh, division sometimes uh, can be uh, overruled, mended somewhat by the international environment. And so it's important to think about how the international environment, the domestic political environment, they interact with each other. And when you have an overriding threat from the outside, you might have the American people come together a bit more in recognition of that. We saw some of that in the immediate aftermath of September 11th. Um, um, today, because the threat from outside is less, I think we tend to focus more on our own domestic political issues uh, um, and divisions. Uh, at the same time, there is an important debate going on right now in the country about international relations that needs to be highlighted. And that is uh, that the United States has to remain committed to our democratic partners. Today, there's a school that has grown up that's called restraint that we should show more restraint in the world. And so, in international relations, uh, one of the questions that's posed to people who look at the international scene is to say, are you in favor of restraint? And that's, like, well, of course I am. Everybody should be restrained. Everybody should be prudent in their behavior. But what restraint means to many is that we should withdraw from our alliances and become more of a hemispheric power, uh, revert to something before the Second World War. Uh, like the interwar period. And I, I disagree fundamentally with that point of view. The United States has to remain engaged in the world, not just in the Western Hemisphere, but also supporting our democratic allies overseas in Europe and in Asia. So it, it is critically important that we stay engaged. And the restraint that means abandoning those alliances is a mistake that will come back to hurt us big time if we follow that. So uh, one of the big debates today in our discourse 
is that between those who want to withdraw more to the Western Hemisphere and, and those that want to stay engaged with the rest of the world outside of the Western Hemisphere. And so that, that's, a, that's a hard one to bridge. Mm -hmm. You're either for that position or against. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in, in that one, uh, we're just going to have to have that back and forth between us and we'll see which side wins out on that debate with the American people. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today and offering your perspectives. Um, we really appreciate it, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for having me. Of course.